Stop motion animation isn't easy. I mean, no animation is easy, but stop motion has a different kind of investment given the reliance on literal handcrafted environments and animation. It's rewarding when a talented team results in detailed character models and a rich world for them to inhabit. This is the case for the Netflix published Rilakkuma and Karu, an adorable, cozy, and sometimes solemn watch bouncing fuzzy goofball creatures with Kaoru's mundane adult problems. Her college friends have moved on to successful careers, gotten married, and have had kids. Her younger co-workers are out having fun sociable lives. Meanwhile, her job stagnates. She lives alone with three not-quite pets in a shabby apartment that will be demolished by the end of the show. All the while, her mother pressures her to return to her small hometown and help with the family farm. For a show with anthropomorphic bird and bears, these are very real, very relatable problems. But it's not just these real-life issues that keep it grounded. It's also the surroundings which Kaoru and her three son ex friends inhabit, specifically the apartment they call home. In all forms of media, be it video games, books, manga, anime, or live action films, environment design is one area I focus heavily on. So much storytelling can be done with the places characters choose to be and are brought to by plot events. In particular, the ways in which a living space is decorated not only by set design teams, but the characters too, excites me. To look at an apartment, bedroom, or the cockpit of a Gundam and get a feel for whoever spends their days in this place. The state it's kept in, what they keep out in public eye, what's tucked away in the closet, how a shelf of books or video games is organized, is the kitchen stove kept clean, or is it covered in tiny spots of grease from a burger cooked days ago? All of it is evidence of a life lived. I've long enjoyed these sorts of details in my media, and the show which serves as the progenitor of all of this is, well, MTV's Room Raiders. Room Raiders was a reality dating series which aired from 2003 to 2009 with a simple premise. Three guys or gals are pseudo-kidnapped from their homes, and one at a time, their would-be date inspects each of their rooms. Poking around and commenting on the decor, clothes, cleanliness, and embarrassing oddities. It was trashy entertainment, but kicked off my fascination of environmental storytelling. Growing up, I often had a reoccurring thought while decorating my room. If someone walked in here, what would they think? Not in an, oh god, they'll find out I'm a nerd, so much as... Is this room expressive of who I am? Clearly, this mindset influences Karu too. But before I get into that... So, what could a stranger suss out if they came into my room with no prior knowledge? One of the first things they might notice is it's not exactly spacious. Maybe I'm frugal, or this was just the best option available. Scattered around the room are shelving units stuffed with all sorts of nerdy memorabilia. Nintendo figures like Mario, Pikachu, and Link. Some are far less recognizable to the average person and straddle a robot figure that looks like a Transformer? Look to a different bookshelf and, ah, it's a Gundam, that's some Japanese thing, they might say. They'd be right. Added together with a shelf of anime DVDs and Blu-rays and then nearly an entire bookcase of manga, they'd get the picture that whoever lives here is into Japanese entertainment. An anime nerd, or maybe they've heard the term weeaboo or otaku. The type of person who goes to anime in video game conventions and probably took a Japanese language course or two in college, which could be confirmed if you look under my bed to find my notes and books from those classes. As far as the video games go, I mean look at this desk, this PC, and this container in my closet. Also, let's refer back to all those figures and this book about Zelda proudly displayed. What else though? It's a fairly tidy room, if a bit crowded. Items of organization, such as a bulletin board with a list of shows being watched and to watch, a calendar, dating video game releases for 2019. Another calendar is push pinned to an adjacent position. Written on it, some shorthand notes, maybe to do's of a sort. Oh, one of them literally says video. And that fairly pricey looking mic is making a little more sense now. If you poked around long enough, you'll find other evidence. For 
furthering the organizational side, such as sticky notes. One of which is written very much like a to-do list, and is plastered right to the side of the TV. As if whoever lives here really needs this to be in their field of vision throughout their day, lest they forget what's there. There's even a little notebook on the desk with more to-dos, quick thoughts, financial scribblings, passwords, a detailed accounting of hours invested into games, reminders, fantasy football rosters, and a whole lot else that the purpose of is indiscernible to an outside eye, but important enough to the owner that they needed to write it down. Open up the closet and it's not exactly the most fashionable person. There are some nicer jackets, but it's mostly t-shirts and jeans. And a lot of it is video game or anime related. But some stuff doesn't quite fit the theme so far. For instance, the painting of a lighthouse, a dilapidated building with seagulls flying above, and shore break. What are these depictions of an ocean setting doing in this little room in Ohio? Well, maybe the occupant hasn't always lived here or enjoys visiting the shore. Given all this, I suspect one could draw a line from the room you see before you to an anime YouTuber, or at least have that information revealed to them and think, okay, that lines up with what I've seen. So Kaoru, the woman who feels left behind, what does her living space tell us? What can we glean about who she is? It's a mixture of a dated apartment with a younger tenant, a homely feel with sparse hints of sleek modernity. With the first shot, one thing is clear, an appreciation for natural light. There are a ton of windows in this place and all the blinds are wide open, bringing a comfortable warmth. Nearly every bit of the apartment is splashed in equally warm or calming colors. There's a strong focus on light blues, orange and yellow accents, with plenty of whites and woods. It's most definitely tidy, too. Stationary utensils are kept in cups next to a couple of notepads. Rugs aren't curled up. There's stuff, knickknacks and whatnot, but it all seems to have a distinct place and purpose. The apartment itself is a bit worn, with faded or chipped paint, but in a way that complements the cozy feel Kaoru has injected. For example, this wooden shelving. On it is an assortment of items. Next to a jar of candy is a pencil holder filled with colored pencils, quite possibly belonging to the childlike bear Kurila Kuma. And above them is a sculpture of the Eiffel Tower. By itself, it doesn't mean a ton. But examined in conjunction with several other items around the apartment, well, Kaoru's desire becomes much clearer. On a separate bookcase is a picture of the Eiffel Tower next to a globe. Across the room, near the door, is a large, dark wooden cabinet and on it several books. Some relating to cooking, like the Italian recipe cookbook right here. Others are specifically map books. There's one of London and the UK, another of Broadway in New York. Sitting in front of them, a camera. Take this all into consideration with Karu's jealousy of her friends and co-workers who are able to take trips around the world, and specifically episode 10's plot of her being left behind by her fuzzy friends when they head to Hawaii, and there's a story there. Kaoru wants to see the world, to venture out and make memories, capturing some of the most dear with her camera. Don't you think it's about time you quit working at that company and come back home? Actually, it's not quite as easy as that. I have responsibilities here too. Oh, don't give me that nonsense. In a corporation as big as the one you've been working for, you're about as important as an ant. Looking around some more, we see plants. Actually, a lot of plants. Not an uncommon item to find in someone's home, but this strikes me as something more personal, beyond just giving the place a more lively look. All of them are very healthy, and we even see her taking care of a garden outside. It seems like she gets a sense of pride out of looking towards all of this greenery, seeing them so vibrant, and knowing such came from her attentiveness. A mentality someone might develop if they grew up on a farm, like Karu. Her floral decorations are a reminder of her childhood home that she is so far from here in the big city. She may not desire to return, but she has fond memories. Living away from her hometown, having her own apartment, it's tied to independence. It goes against her mother's wishes for her to return and help with the family farm, to give up on her silly job, to admit defeat in her pursuit of being an adult, as Karu and society defines. Her apartment is proof of success. 
She has a home she's comfortable in. It's modest but brings her joy. The self-sufficiency is a value. The fridge seems to be well stocked and Kaoru puts those cookbooks to good use. One of the first things we learn about her in the pilot is a point of pride she has over the picnic food she makes every year for her friends during the cherry blossom bloom. She comes across as responsible, if fallible, more often than not, budgeting accordingly, keeping the place tidy, though the adorable curatory certainly helps in that regard. There are numerous little containers and organizers around the place. Reiterating once more, everything has a distinct place and purpose. And because it is all so well taken care of, not strewn about or thrown down in the first semi-open space available, likely to be damaged or lost, the sentimental value of it all is clear. Which Kaoru speaks to this when she mentions how long she has had her rain boots and umbrella. How she picks up that umbrella and says, this is my favorite. You get the sense that there's a story there. That maybe one day in junior high, she forgot hers and had to share a classmate's. The rain briefly stopped before they parted ways, and that classmate gave Karu the umbrella, sprouting a friendship that waned, but Karu still holds it dear as a reminder of an old friend. There's a bit of Marie Kondo in this, how all the items within exist to bring her joy. When the four of them have to move out during the finale, Kaoru forces her three fuzzy friends to hold each item in their hands and keep only what is most precious, to let all else go and enjoy the resulting freedom. No matter where Kaoru, Rilakuma, Kurilakuma, and Kiroitori end up, one thing is certain, they'll make their new home an extension of themselves. It may not be flashy, the kitchen chairs may be mismatched for the sake of individual comfort, it might be a place of practicality, but it most certainly will be one of comfort. So my room is probably making a whole lot of sense right now. Like Kaoru's modest home, it is a place of both physical and mental comfort. My gunpla is validation for my enjoyment of Gundam. The admiration I have for the art on my walls, the berserk piece by Hamlet Machine, the Cowboy Bebop movie poster I got off of an R anime user. I look at them and think, yes, what I enjoy does have artistic merit. These are passionate, stylish drawings. They aren't just important to me, but important to know I'm not the only one to own any of this. This room is unique to me when you add up all the individual pieces, but these pieces exist in numerous homes and have great value to their owners. Such a connection is acknowledgement of our desire to have others enjoy what we enjoy, just as we push a show on someone. We don't do so only because we want them to be entertained, but we want someone to talk to. All of this is tied up in that. When I go into someone's home for the first time, I observe all of these sorts of details. I want to read that person. I want to better understand them via the space they live in. It's communication, which I hope over the course of this channel's existence it has become clear how much I value such. I get that this is tied up in financial issues, that some folks would love to make their homes more descriptive of themselves but aren't able to. I'd really love to get rid of this children's desk and replace it with a much larger one with space to write and build gunpla. I need another shelf or two. This Cowboy Bebop collection looks silly tucked into such a small space. So do what you can with what you've got. A space can be plenty descriptive with limited options and not need to rely on minimalism. Be your own environmental designer. Create a comfortable and communicative space which brings you joy. If you'd like to help me get rid of that children's desk, be sure to donate to my Patreon like the fine folks listed here. While this channel is growing and I am making a tiny bit of money off the ad revenue, the best way to support any creator is through their Patreon, so why don't you give mine a dollar or two and you can get access to some bonus posts. I've recently been talking about 25 of my favorite games, and also been clearing through a lot of the anime in my backlog, like Paranoia Agent, Sailor Moon, and Mobile Suit Gundam. A single dollar will get you access to those posts. So until next time, thank you for watching.